Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So Hare Krishna, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. I would uh, like to seek your uh, good wishes and your blessings so that we can enter into the nectar of uh, chapter 9 of the 8th canto. Uh, very interesting uh, chapters here uh, we're going through. So this is one of the verses. Um, it has the last verse of the ninth uh, chapter. Let's try to read this one. It's a nice long one. Oh, uh, Naliben, yes? We're doing chapter eight and nine today. Oh, is it eight and nine? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm just checking. I was just checking if anybody was on the call. And yeah, Naliben, Krishna, I was going to tell you. Well, you were too. <laughs> Nali Ben wins the prize. So she's doing chapters 10, 11, and 12. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank she's you, keeping Nali. an Hare eye Krishna. on you. Hare Krishna. Keep Hare it. Krishna. I was going to tell you, but I said maybe I am mistaken. So I was checking. What did I do? What did I send you? In the Malekama, because I write down what chapters we have done. Because yes, I I, because so I'm doing the I lesson. That's why I'm checking. I'm going to have to be very careful with you guys, isn't I? <laughs> now, thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, no cheating here. <laughs> it will keep you on your toes. Now, we probably will keep you on your toes. <laughs> really good. Very, very good. No thank more you. ladies than men. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done. Okay. Uh, for that bit of excitement. Um, <laughs> evam vrishya vipachari sakunetet varam nija kashayata Ya gunashrayam Vavri varam sarva gune apekshitam Ramamukundam nirapeksham ipshitam. Naniven, like to read? Sure, yeah. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Sukhdev Goswami continued in this way, after full deliberation, the goddess of fortune accepted Mukund as her husband, because although he is independent and not in want of her, he possesses all transcendental qualities and mystic powers and is therefore the most desirable. Hare Krishna. Very good. So this is a very, very interesting chapter. Um, the uh, goddess Fortune appears and we'll see what happens when she appears. So let's, let's go into it. So this uh, is... Um, chapter's name is The Churning of the Milk Ocean. So this chapter describes how Goddess of Fortune appeared during the churning of the ocean of milk and how she accepted Lord Vishnu as her husband. After that, uh, the Nvantari appeared with a pot of nectar and of course the demons immediately snatched it from him. But then Vishnu did something extraordinary. Uh, he came um, in a female form Mohini, to show Lakshmi Devi that he's even more beautiful than her. <laughs> the most beautiful incarnation. Just to captivate the demons uh, and save the nectar for the demigods. So, what came out of the churning? So, if you recall, demons and the demigods, they were churning the ocean, working hard. Poison came out first. Shiva, Lord Shiva, drank it or didn't drink, he held it in his throat. He protected everybody. Then the demigods and the demons, they took courage and they started the, resumed their activity of churning. Sukadev Goswami explains the other products that came from the churning. So we got a few things here. First, the Surabi cow, Gomata, her, she came. What are her qualities? Gives milk, butter, ghee for sacrifice. Who took her? Well, all of these matters, these products are used for Yagya. So the great sages took her. And then the Uchashvriya, but a <coughs> horse came, as white as the moon. And Bali Maharaj, he took possession of the horse. Airavart, the white elephant came with its four tusks. It defies even Mount Kailash. Indra took possession, as we, we, as we know. Then eight elephants and eight female, male and female elephants who can go in any direction. Nobody could get all of them. <laughs> they just fled. Kastubha, Mani, and uh, 
Padmarga Raga Mani. They decorate the chest of the Lord, Lord Vishnu. So, of course, that's the possession of Lord Vishnu anyway. Parijata flower fulfills the desires of everyone. They were taken by the celestial planets, the heavenly planets. They decorate the heavenly planets. And Indra especially has a very special Parijata tree in his courtyard. Apsaras uh, came from uh, one of the products of the churning, heavenly damsels. And they have, their quality, they have attractive movements which bewilders everybody. And they belong to the heavenly citizens. So they took them. Then the goddess of fortune came, Brahma, surpassed the lightning on a marble mountain. Of course, she belongs to Vishnu. But we'll see a little bit more detail about her when she comes out. And the final two things, Varuni, the vine, Varuni came, possessed by Varun. Oh, yeah, actually the owner is Varun, the um, deity in charge of water, controls the drunkards <laughs> and the demons took her away, took the Varuni away. Danvantari, uh, with a pot of nectar. And this is the uh, nectar that they were all churning the ocean for, could make one immortal. So the demigods uh, took that eventually by the help of Mohini, as we'll see. So these are all the products that came out. So Lakshmi Ji is worshipped. The goddess of fortune, uh, Lakshmi appeared. The demigods, great sages, Gandharvas and others offered her their respectful worship. All the sacred rivers personified, brought pure water for her bathing ceremony which was performed by great sages. The clouds in personified form beat various types of drums and blue conch shells, oops, shells, <laughs> and bugles. <laughs> the ocean supplied the upper and lower portions of a yellow silicon garben, garment. Silicon. 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 <laughs> oh yeah, silicon. Good point. Varun. Probably want to go to Silicon Valley. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they must have had that in those days. <laughs> Varun presented flower garlands surrounded by bumblebees drunk with honey. Vikshuk Sen um, supplied varieties of decorated ornaments. Saraswati, the goddess of learning, supplied a necklace. Brahma, a lotus flower. And the inhabitants of Naglok supplied earrings. <laughs> So she was welcomed very beautifully because she is the goddess of fortune. Goddess of fortune could not find anyone among the demigods to accept her as her husband. So she was looking. She saw Durvasa who has good quality of austerity, but he gets angry too quickly. She saw Bharaspati full of knowledge, but he's attached, attached to his family. <laughs> she saw Brahma, he's great, but He's got lusty desires. He, she saw Indra, he's a controller, but he also depends on others. She saw Sukracharya, very religious minded, but not very friendly to the souls. She saw Daksha, he's very renounced, but he's not liberated. She saw Sumba and Nisumba, very strong, but ultimately defeated by time. She saw the four Kumaras, they're free from everything, but they're little kids, <laughs> not a suitable companion. She saw Bali, the enemy of Indra, who's got a very long life, but his conduct is not so good. She saw the humans, good conduct, but they don't live very long. <laughs> she saw Lord Shiva, ah, longevity and good conduct, but mm, he covers himself in ashes, He's got snakes all around him. Doesn't even have a proper abode, inauspicious habits. But then her eyes went on Lord Vishnu, Mukunda, very well qualified. And he doesn't even desire me. So the goddess of fortune could find, not find anybody among the demigods to accept her. At last she selected Lord Vishnu to be her master. Lord Vishnu gave her a place to stay everlastingly at her ch his chest. Although he is independent and not in want of her, 
she placed the lotus garland on him and waited shyly for the Lord to accept her at his chest. Lord Vishnu's chest became the abode of two types of luxury. One is his consort, the mother of the three worlds, and second is the personification of wealth. So she's got two aspects to her. Since Lakshmi stays in the bosom of Lord Vishnu, she naturally sees any devotee who worships her and blesses that devotee with all opulence. So if we worship Vishnu, automatically Lakshmi is there on his chest. But the karmis, those who are after wealth, they try to worship Lakshmi. They want money. They want Lakshmi's blessings or mercy. But they're not devotees of Vishnu. They don't care for Narayan. So that opulence is flickering. She'll only stay where Narayan is. The opulence of the devotees is as permanent as Vishnu's opulence. So because the devotees, the Vaishnavas, they worship Vishnu. Lakshmi is always with Vishnu. They never have to worry. Because of this combination of Lakshmi and Narayan, all who were present, including the demigods and people in general, were very pleased. The demons, however, being neglected by the goddess of fortune, were very depressed. <laughs> then Varuni, so after the goddess of fortune, who came? Varuni came. This is the goddess of drink, drinking, who controls drunkards. She was generated, and by the order of Lord Vishnu, the, Lord, the demons accepted this young girl. Varuni means the food of Varun. Then the demons and the demigods with renewed energy began to churn again because it hadn't quite finished yet. There was something very special to come. This time, a partial incarnation of Lord Vishnu called Danvantari appeared. He was very beautiful and he carried a, a jug containing nectar. Oh, where's his picture gone? There he is. There he is. Very, very beautiful. None other than Lord Vishnu himself. And he's carrying the pot of nectar. This is what they've been working hard for. The demons immediately snatched the jug from Danvantari's hand and began to run away. The demigods being very uh, morose, morose sorry, yeah, took shelter of Vishnu who assured them not to be aggrieved as he would bewilder the demons with his energy. After the demons snatched the jug from Danvantari, they began to fight amongst themselves. Lord Vishnu, having solaced the demigods, did not fight, but remained silent. So this is generally what happens right? when... Uh, what was that joke uh, that the thieves, they raided a bank, stole the money, and then they sat down and said, look, we've got to be honest and split this fairly, this uh, what we've stolen. But uh, the, the nature of uh, demons is that they'll fight amongst themselves as well. While the fighting was going on amongst the demons, the Lord himself appeared as the incarnation, Mohini Murti the most beautiful woman in the universe. Her complexion resembled in color a newly grown blackish lotus and every part of her body was beautifully situated. Her cheeks were very beautiful. Her nose was raised and her face full of youthful luster. Because of the movements of her eyebrows as she smiled with shyness and glanced over the demons, all the demons were saturated with lusty desires and every one of them desired to possess her. So this is an example of uh, Mohini Murti. Very, very beautiful. So that is the end of the chapter. Uh, just again uh, to uh, confirm how many incarnate. There may have been even more, but we know definitely, definitely there were six. Lord Kurma, whose back was scratched, the thousand-armed Vishnu who's sitting on top of the mountain and holding it steady, Ajita who was helping the demigods churn the ocean, and then Lord Vishnu entered the demons, 
uh, the demigods and Vasuki as call a passion, goodness, and ignorance to encourage them and increase their strength to do the churning. And then Danvantari came, number five, who is the original Ayurved doctor. And then Mohini Murti, so six incarnations, really phenomenal pastime. So that's the end of the chapter. Any questions, any comments? So what about uh, Goddess Rama? Uh, she's the mother of Rama, right? Ah. She, she appeared, but uh, she, what is her fortune? Same, yeah. Rama is another name for her. Yeah, but she appeared at this time, but it is, uh, but she's oh. always been there as well, isn't it? Yeah, she's always with uh, Lord uh, Narayan in the spiritual world. But this one is a different Lakshmi. It's an expansion so this, of that Lakshmi. So there should be number seven, seven in Carnations instead of six. <laughs> if you include Lakshmi Devi as the, the consort, yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm just thinking of the questions later on coming. So I was thinking, <laughs> this, this, thinking ahead. <laughs> whether six or seven I should write. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Nalini. Yes, I like it. Hare Krishna. Yes. One yes. question, please. Why did uh, Lord Shiva kept the poison in his throat? Oh, good question. Not sure. What's the answer? I'm asking question. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, you know the answer. Right. Okay. In Ramayana, it is said that uh, Lord Shiva did not drink the poison because as soon as he took the poison in his mouth, he, he remembered that his Ishta Dev, Lord Ram, is sitting in his heart. So he didn't <laughs> swallow the poison. He kept it there. Nice one. Mm -hmm. I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I, I think I heard somewhere that also Parvati stopped it going any further down as well. Uh, I don't know about Parvati because she was she was happy that Lord Shiva was drinking mm -hmm. the poison yeah, to save but humanity. Yeah, she didn't go down any further. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, similar reason, okay. yeah. Very interesting. <laughs> A nice one. I like that one. Amazing, isn't it? Lord Shiva. Krishna. Mm. Amazing. Also, Lord Shiva, what happened to him when he saw Moini Devi? <laughs> oh, that's coming up. Yeah, that, that's a whole chapter on that. Okay, okay, okay. okay. But, but we shouldn't misunderstand because this Mohini Murti is not an ordinary uh, personality, the Supreme Lord himself. So it's not surprising that even Lord Shiva can become bewildered by Mohini Murti because that is none different from Vishnu himself. So this is the internal energy of the Lord. It's not the external. So even being um, attracted by that doesn't make him, Shiva, any inferior because he's attracted by the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So actually it's, uh, it's fine. <laughs> he's allowed. <laughs> so chapter nine. Wow, you take that one on. <laughs> Try. <laughs> Yet you chatty a shoe washuk, a mamma no washo be a heart match. Jadai shun near bestat a shut a take a squat. There a was at Pavati yet creati a practavat. Sarvashat at Pavati mula nishanam yat. Who'd like to read? Can I continue? Yes, go for it. Yes. In human society, there are various activities performed for the protection of one's wealth and life by one's words, one's mind, and one's actions. But they're all performed for one's personal or extended sense gratification with reference to the body. All these activities are baffled because of being separate from devotional service. But when the same activities are performed for the satisfaction of the Lord, the beneficial results are distributed to everyone, just as water poured onto the root of a tree is distributed throughout the entire tree. Hare Krishna. Excellent. Amazing verse. Amazing verse. Whatever we're doing now, we don't have to stop it. This is the most glorious thing about bhakti. All we have to do is dovetail it to the Lord. Perform it for the satisfaction of the Lord. 
That's all. And whatever we're doing now, it becomes not something that will keep us in this world, but it will free us from this world. That is extraordinary. That is absolutely extraordinary. What a worse. So we'll come, uh, we'll come to that again. This, is, uh, this chapter is called The Lord Incarnates as Mohini Murti. The demons being enchanted by the beauty of Mohini form agreed to hand over the container of nectar to Mohini Devi, who tactfully delivered it to the demigods. <laughs> Mohini captivates the demons. When the demons got possession of the container of nectar and were fighting each other, an extraordinarily beautiful young woman appeared before them. All the demons became captivated by this young woman's beauty and became attached to her. Because the demons were fighting amongst themselves to possess the nectar, they selected this beautiful woman as a mediator to settle their quarrel. So this was an extraordinary act uh, by the Lord. The Lord is also the most beautiful among those women, surpassing even Lakshmi's beauty. To prove this to Lakshmi, the Lord showed this form as Mohini, challenging Lakshmi. <laughs> Very interesting. Mohini first informed the demons that they should not place their trust in her. They should not have faith in her. So the demons were thinking, ah, she's only joking. Such a beautiful woman. How can she lie? <laughs> but of course, <laughs> she was indirectly telling them that I am going to cheat you. <laughs> so they gave the nectar to her. She was certainly speaking seriously, but the demons being captivated by her bodily features took her words as a joke. Taking advantage of their weakness in this regard, Mohini, the incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, got the demons to promise that whatever decision she might give, they will, would not refuse to accept it. So they would have to accept it. Because they were captivated by her, um, they agreed to any condition that she would place. So she made them promise, don't question my decision. So this is Mohini with the nectar the demons had given to her. And they are here asking for the nectar. And the demigods, very calm, relaxed. They know that the Supreme Lord is in control. <laughs> so Mohini gives the nectar to the demigods. The demigods and demons then observed a fast. So they're full of etiquette, even the demons. They fasted. After bathing, they offered clarified butter and oblations into the fire, gave charity to the cows and the Brahmins and members of the other orders of society, Kshatriyas, Vaishya, and Shudra, who were all rewarded as they deserved. After that, the demigods and demons performed ritualistic ceremonies under the guidance of the Brahmanas. Then they dressed themselves with new garments according to their own choice, decorated their bodies with ornaments, and sat facing east on seats made of kusha grass. So they were ready for the nectar. Mohini Murti entered and had the demigods and demons sit in different lines so that she could distribute the nectar. She knew that the demons were quite unfit to drink the nectar. Therefore, by cheating them with her sweet words and bewildering gestures, she distributed all the nectar to the demigods. So let's have a look at this. There you go. So she would bewilder them by her bodily movements, her sweet smile, her speech. And the demons, they got bewildered. In the meantime, she would distribute the nectar to the devatas. Really interesting pictures, Ganesh and Shiva. Hmm. So uh, when the demons saw she, that she was cheating, they still didn't protest. They had promised that they wouldn't protest, but they didn't protest for a number of reasons, apart from the promise. They didn't want to fight with a woman. They were captivated by her, but also they wanted to show them, wanted to show her that they were heroes. They could be patient. They will wait their turn. Let the demigods enjoy, and then we'll get the nectar. 
So they were quite proud of themselves. However, one demon named Rahu, he dressed himself like a demigod and he sat in the line of the demigods. He sat between the sun and the moon. But the Supreme Personality of God had understood that Rahu was cheating. He immediately cut off the demon's head. Rahu, however, had already tasted the nectar and therefore, although his head was severed, he remained alive. His head remained alive. alive. Lord Brahma accepted Rahu's head as one of the planets. So that's still there. Since Rahu is an eternal enemy of the sun and the moon, he always tries to attack them on the nights of the full moon and the dark moon. After the demigods finished drinking the nectar, the Supreme Personality God assumed his own form. So somewhere, here you go. This is a uh, Mohini chops his head off. But this is Rahu, He's still there in the uh, sky somewhere. Lord Brahma has made him a special planet. And he always, because he was in the between the sun and the moon, causing friction, he's still doing the same. Rahu is always there, causes the eclipses. And these moments of eclipses are supposed to be very inauspicious. Hence why we don't look at the eclipse or we stay indoors like that. In human society, there are various activities performed for the protection of one's wealth and life by one's words, mind, and actions. But they are all performed for one's personal or extended sense gratification with reference to the body. All these activities are baffled because of being separate from devotional service. So this is the verse we read. When the same activities are performed for the satisfaction of the Lord, the beneficial results are distributed to everyone, just as water poured onto a, the root of a tree is distributed throughout the entire tree. So really important verse, very, very important verse. So that's the end of chapter nine. Any questions, any comments? Very interesting chapter. Babuji, yes. Why is Rahu the an eternal enemy, the moon and the sun? Any, oh, any, is there a story behind it? Uh there probably is another story. But in this pastime, he uh, disguised himself as a demigod, and he sat between them. Yes. And everybody missed him. Yeah. Except. The moon and the sun did see him, and they were thinking, this is not a demigod. So they actually alerted Mohini, who at the simultaneously knew that this was the demon. So she chopped him off. Because of that, he's always had a enmity for the sun and the moon. Okay, after this incident? After this incident. Okay. There may be something before. Okay. Which I, I'm not aware of, but I know after this, he was particularly upset with the sun and the moon. Okay. Yeah. So he constantly causes grief for them. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. So are they two, the body and the head? Are they Rahu and Ketu? Who's Ketu? I can't remember now. Yeah. Is that, yeah. Is that the body then? The, the body, yes. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So the body, I thought the body was not eternal. Interesting. Hari Bol, Hari Krishna. Hari Krishna. Hari Bol, Jai, Shubhadu, Kunti, Jai, Shubhadu. Yeah, this is uh, with Rahu and, and Ketu, they're always there, plays a very significant part in everybody's astrology. This is just Rahu lacks the body, but he's eternal, and he has the head, so he's all devouring. He just wants, 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 but he doesn't get satisfied because he doesn't have a body. So he's just an all devouring. So he encourages this devouring nature within everyone, you know, influences them and, and encourage everyone just, just greed and all that. So Rahu has that tendency. And then Ketu, 
lacking the body. So the Ketu is also just seeking, searching, and influences everyone to for understanding, but it's like headless chicken, you know, just running around, <laughs> disturbing everyone's. Uh, <laughs> uh, so my daughter is doing astrology, you know, she's do doing this, she's explaining to about how this Kerahu Ketu, you know, how play a part in and how they influence. But ultimately, they're Krishna's plan somehow is placed them, Rahu and Ketu, within this material universe so that they play their part in everyone's life in a way. But ultimately, they're trying to bring about understanding in everyone that all these materialistic things will eventually either be a pain to you or suffering or whatever and ultimately you come to our senses and divert ourselves to devotional service so they have a part Rahu and Ketu they're ultimately somehow or the other Krishna's plan but one question I wanted to ask is now that these demigods have had the nectar <laughs> and are they now eternal, immortal, as they are within the body, or would they, I don't know, I don't, yeah. is that how the demigod's position is now, that yeah, they're yeah. immortal, now that they've got nectar? Nectar, yeah. No. <laughs> we'll see that in the next chapter, actually. They get beaten again <laughs> by the demons. <laughs> The demons have a part to play in this, uh, somewhere. <laughs> yeah, but, oh, okay, now mystery unfolds. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're in more as long Krishna? as the universes are there. <laughs> Sorry, Maritran Prabhu, you just said your daughter yeah. is astrologer. She's she's studying astrology. She's a psychotherapist. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay. But she helps people, you know, but she's done a lot of deep astrology study you know, well, I, sort of, I need to consult I'll ask her what the, <laughs> yes you know I just want to consult an astrologer because I'm planning to set my daughter's wedding so I want to know a few things on the yeah. time and things like that please ask her and you let me know thank you yeah but and and, and I'll ask her what the name of uh, this demon was before he okay. became Rahu and Ketu she okay. said to me the name, but I kind of forget. You know, she describes me a lot of things about how the different planets and demigods and how they play a part. You know, uh, so yeah, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll Prabhuji, ask her. Please ask yeah. her. Ask her to come one day on this platform and give a class, please. Ask okay. Nabi Prabhu okay. first. Yeah, I'll ask Nabi and to see if yeah. she's yeah. Thank yeah. You. Okay, she's with us at the moment. Yeah. yeah, it's probably a bit time. Planets. Yeah. Okay, anybody else? Any okay. Uh, Thank you, Bob. Uh, anybody else? Okay, so let's, uh, um, in the Lekamaji, have a look at the lessons. lessons yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Hare Krishna, all. Prindaraj, Himad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. So lesson for um, Canto 8 so far, chapter 1, if we want to listen to the past times of the Lord to perfect this human life, we should inquire submissively from a bona fide spiritual master and carry out their instructions dutifully. Chapter 2, we are all living in the delusion that our wealth and family members will save us a time of death, danger, but actually only the Supreme Personality of Godhead can rescue us at all times. Chapter three, our ultimate goal of life is to understand that we are all caught up by the eternal time and we may die at any moment. So we should take shelter of the Supreme Personality of God and who can save us from the struggle of this material world. Chapter four, if ever we are cursed by great personalities, we should accept it as blessing in disguise because at the end, the outcome are very beneficial. Chapter five, in this material world, possessing too much wealth is risky because one may become puffed up and may not care about others. Thus, one may commit offenses and may fall down. Chapter six, it is nice to welcome others to our place. Even if they are not our friends, we should try to know their intention as it could be for our own good. Chapter seven, at times we are not happy with what comes our way, thinking that the grass is greener on the other side, but the Lord has his own plan for us. Hare Krishna. Thank you. 
Now, uh, Madhusun Babu, I've just seen your um, <laughs> your um, uh, instructions, but um, if you can just read them out, please. Are you there? Sorry, yeah, I had to unmute myself. Sorry, I forgot to. Uh, yeah, okay, wait a minute. So chapter eight, if one wants, it, it says in the purport, you know, that if one wants the favor of the goddess of fortune, Mother Lakshmi, because she is by nature Bhagavat Para, uh, one must keep her with Narayan. The devotees who always engage in the service of Narayan, Narayan Parayan, can easily achieve the favor of the goddess of fortune without a doubt. But materialists who try to um, get the favor of the goddess of fortune only to possess her for personal enjoyment are frustrated. Theirs is, theirs is not a good policy. The, the celebrated demon Ravan, for example, wanted to deprive Ramchandra of Lakshmi Sita and thus be victorious, but the result was just the opposite. So it's the position of Lakshmi, and then we uh, ultimately, you know, if we have Narayan, we worship Narayan, then Lakshmi is there. You, you mentioned that in the class. So, uh, as we saw in chapter nine, you know, Mohini Murti comes along, and uh, she certainly cheats. So sometimes it said here, Prabhupada said that sometimes an incarnation of the supreme personality of Godhead cheats the atheists. So we can understand. We should understand the interaction between Mohini Murti and the demons and how she distributes the, the nectar. So, so, you know, because the demons were all just uh, um, uncooperative amongst themselves and fighting, and there were stronger demons trying to take over, and the weaker demons were trying to pacify. So, you know, we should include the demigods and all this. So, it, it just shows the nature of selfishness. And this reminds me of a just very quick story of a uh, Christian kind of background, but it's just about heaven and hell. When uh, this one particular priest was just, uh, it was a bit good or bad in his life, whatever, but he goes to the gate of pearl and uh, pearl, pearly gates or whatever they call it, in heaven in heaven. So he would say, well, this way is hell and this way is heaven. But he said, do you want to have a trailer of either of them? So you decide where you'd want to end up. So he says, okay, this is the picture of hell. Um, so he, go, he goes in, the, in, in there in a massive big room, a table full of food, you know, laid down in all varieties of types of food and all that. And then the, he saw all the residents of hell just sitting there at the table, wanting to eat all that food but the hands were tied at the back. So they just couldn't eat, but they were all starving and skinny and they were just like, you know, they, they were just couldn't eat that food. So they went into heaven side and it was the picture was the same, uh, except that the, the people were very happy, joyous, they were satisfied. They, so then they realized that they've, they've also got their hands tied at the back. But what's the difference, you know? But the guys in the heaven had decided that, you know, they would pick up the spoon and they would feed each other. So they, 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 they were all satisfied, you know, that food was there, but they could pick up the spoon, feed the other guy with their mouth. They don't have to use the hands, but they were feeding each other. And that was the difference between heaven and hell. So it's a bit like this demon and demigods, you know. Demigods want to help each other and cooperate and all that, and just reflects the qualities of a demon who are selfish more. Okay, thank you, Haribo. I like that story, very nice, very good pastime. Thank you. It's just, uh, just in a comparison, like crude example, but just shows demonic qualities selfish qualities and then heaven and hell. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> so, so good. 
So, uh, unless there's any comments or questions, we're going to go to the Nishin.